Hello. My name is Matt Nowell, and I'm the eBSD Product Manager here at EDAX, and welcome to today's on-demand presentation entitled, Using Combined EBSD EDS to Characterize Solidification Microstructures in Additive Manufactured Materials. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. First, at the bottom of the console, uh, there are a few different application widgets you can use. Uh, one of them is the Q&A widget. You can use this uh, to submit a question. Uh, that will be sent to us and will be answered later via email. Uh, there's an additional uh, widget that allows access to the resource list. Uh, that will give you a copy of today's presentation if you're interested. Today's presentation if you're interested. So just a quick introduction of, of what I'm going to talk about in this uh, webinar. I'm going to present the motivation of why I'm interested in these type of materials. Uh, I'm going to show um, some background on additive manufactured TIE 6.4. I'm going to introduce Prius imaging. Uh, and then I'm going to show some OIM analysis results of, of uh, additive manufactured titanium. Uh, so some simultaneous EBSD EDS analysis and summarize the work. So uh, I've been doing EBSD for over 20 years now, and um, this slide sort of captures the, the motivation I have for characterizing microstructure and, and how processing uh, can influence microstructure, and I'll try to tie that into additive manufacturing. But this is a, a, a set of images I saw years ago uh, from Nike Golf. I'm a golfer, so I get interested about golf clubs. Uh, and this showed um, the idea that if you process materials differently, you'd get a different uh, grain structure or microstructure. So the image here on the top left shows a forged microstructure uh, where it says you have linear grains. Uh, the bottom left image shows a cast microstructure with more of a random distribution. So we'd have a, an isotropic and an anisotropic uh, distribution of properties. Uh, and so they claim that by forging their material, they get a, a specific grain structure which improves their material properties. Now, I did buy these golf clubs, and, and uh, I'd like to say that I, I did play a little bit better with them, and I'd like to attribute that somewhat to, to microstructure. Um, but more importantly, it does tie into sort of material science 101, that your, your microstructure uh, is created by how you've processed the materials, and that microstructure defines your final material properties. Uh, and I think that's important as we talk about additive manufacturing, because similar to how a cast golf club and a... Um, forged golf club will look similar, um, the underlying microstructure will, will give different performance. So these are just some microstructures of, of forged and cast golf clubs we looked at, and we saw that um, you know, the forged golf club did have a stronger elastic response than a cast golf club. And so uh, when I think about additive manufacturing in general, you know, it, it's easy enough to print up a, a, a component or a part that's going to look the same but how it performs will actually be dictated by the, the microstructure. And since it's a relatively new uh, fabrication and manufacturing technique, uh, as these parts are used in more high-performance applications, it's important that we understand uh, the final properties and how to, how to control those uh, via uh, deposition and solidification control. So this is just an example. Um, this is from a TIE 6.4 alloy. Um, this is from a, a, an implant device. Um, it was additively manufactured. We assumed it was hipped after, after uh, uh, creation to, to reduce fatigue problems. Uh, and what we see here, these are images from, from EBSD. These are EBSD orientation maps. Uh, collected these at two different spatial scales, um, the one on the left uh, at a lower magnification with a 600 nanometer step size, the one on the right with a 200 nanometer step size to resolve some finer features. Um, you can see this is with this alloy, we're, we're um, primarily a hexagonal crystal structure in alpha phase titanium. Uh, and you can see that they, these form sort of packets that will be defined by the prior grain size of the beta phase. And as we collected this data, um, we collected the EBSD and we also collected the EDS data, the full spectrum. Uh, collected at each point. Uh, and so these orientation maps show the crystal orientation uh, via that colored stereographic triangle. So if it's red, it's, a, it's an O1 basal orientation. Uh, blues would be the, the 1O bar 1O orientation. 
and we see a quick visualization of the microstructure uh, using eBSD. Now, to get an idea of uh, how additive manufactured materials compare uh, to traditionally processed materials, uh, you can get uh, an idea here. This is from a, a chart from uh, Advanced Materials and Processes a couple of years ago, um, where we can see that the additive manufactured materials are, are pretty comparable uh, to traditional materials, but reported better fatigue performance. So the idea is, can we measure microstructure with eBSD and correlate that with the material properties and performance? And once we have these measurement metrics, can we use those to help uh, drive microstructural engineering to improve on those performance. Uh, so what I'd like to try to do is to show the type of microstructure we can measure with EBSD on these type of materials. So the first step uh, I want to show is just microstructural imaging. So the image on the left here is what we call an EBSD image quality map. This is just a map that qualitatively visualizes the microstructure. Uh, on the right we have what we call a Prius map, and this is a, a relatively new approach uh, I'll show a slide that details what it does, but it, it shows a similar microstructural contrast, but we can collect this in significantly less time. And with this approach, we can also get multiple contrast mechanisms that may provide uh, a little bit broader uh, type of information in contrast to a material. So PRIUS stands for P Pattern Region of Interest Analysis System. So generally, um, with EBSD, we, we polish a sample very nicely, and then we tilt it around 70 degrees. Uh, and so under this configuration, generally, we don't get a lot of contrast or signal. Uh, we don't get a lot of contrast with the, the secondary electron detector shown there in that little schematic in the top left. And because we're tilted, we don't get a lot of signal back on our backscatter detector uh, as well. Generally, the solution to this has been to put a little uh, electron detection diode on the bottom or the perimeter of a phosphor screen on the EBSD detector, as shown there. Um, the trick with that is um, you're, you're tied to a physical diode one, and that diode really isn't positioned at the point of maximum signal. Uh, and so the approach we came up with is to actually use the EBSD detector, the phosphor screen in the low light camera, as an array of electron imaging detectors. So you can see there on the schematic on the lower left, we've taken our phosphor screen, uh, we've created a five by five grid and, and placed that over there, and each of those little uh, boxes in the grid act as an ROI, region of interest detector, to monitor the electron signal as we raster the beam across the surface. So as we do that, we can, we can monitor the signal and create an image for each one of those detectors. And that's shown there on the right, that each detector will create a, a microstructural image, uh, and then we get different contrast mechanisms uh, for each ROI from the detector. So this just shows using Prius in a mode we call Prius Live as an imaging technique. Uh, when we do this, we're able to create grayscale and color images. We can, we can do some processing of adding, subtracting, or weighting, uh, remove intensity gradients that come from geometrical effects, and do some contrast enhancements. And so it's a technique where we can get a, an image in a minute or two to get a lot of, uh, of information. And if I show these different Prius images on the TIE 64, you can see depending on which quadrants we select and what coloring schemes we do, we can see uh, the, the microstructure, uh, the, the laths in, inside those different grains show up pretty nicely for very quick microstructural imaging using Prius. Now, of course, with EBSD, we can go beyond just uh, qualitative microstructural imaging, but we can start to do quantitative measurements as well. So at each point, we, we, uh, we collect a diffraction pattern. We analyze it both for what phase is detected and what the crystal orientation is. So for this particular sample, uh, each pattern was analyzed to see if it matched an alpha hexagonal phase titanium or a beta cubic phase. And so in, in the microstructure, about 2% of the measurement points were classified as beta. Um, generally, uh, the retained beta phase is pretty small, so as our step size uh, decreases, as we see there on the right, we resolve the prior beta or the retained beta grains a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> and so if we're looking for very small amounts of phase distributions, generally we go to, to smaller 
uh, step sizes um, to try to increase the amount of volume that we're, the area we're actually measuring uh, with a given step size. And this map now, once we have the data, we can, we can do what we call partitioning. Uh, and so here I'm only showing the orientations of the beta uh, measurements. So we can see that we, we form little beta grains. We can kind of see the shape of the prior beta grains here. We see the orientations with the colored stereographic triangle. Um, you know, you can actually reconstruct uh, prior grain structure using orientations and orientation relationships. Or in this case, we can just sort of visualize it. Uh, the average beta grain size here is about 600 nanometers. Um, and and we're, we're looking at, a, at, in this case, around 2,000 beta grains were detected and we're, we're grouping those together. Now, of course, if only 2% of the measurements are, are beta, that means quite a bit of it, 98% uh, is the hexagonal alpha phase. So in this map, what we've done is we've grouped together orientations as grains. And so we've defined a grain tolerance angle, in this case, 5 degrees. So if the misorientation between one pixel to the other is below that tolerance, those pixels are, are added together and clustered as what we term grains. And so once we've determined what the grains are, uh, in these um, images we've just randomly colored the grains uh, to show sort of size, shape, and morphology uh, of, the, of the resulting microstructure. So while previously colors indicated orientations, here they're just random, but they give us an idea what the grains look like. Uh, and we can see, we kind of see a nice laffy uh, basket weave type structure um, present uh, kind of in both scales of the microstructure. As we go to higher resolution on the right, we see it resolved a little bit more clearly, but it's pretty homogeneous if we look at the larger area on the left. So what we're able to do here is because we have the orientations present, we can look at what's the, the, the misorientations present uh, between these grains. So the distribution here on the top left uh, shows the point-to-point -point misorientation distributions. So we see on that distribution, first there are a few peaks down at the lower end. Uh, these would suggest some amount of, of localized plastic deformation. Then we see some higher specific peaks uh, on the higher end. Um, if we look at the distribution on the, on the right, we added a few other curves. We have a correlated distribution which is the point-to-point -point, uh, misorienta misorientation distribution. Then we have the uncorrelated distribution, which compares one point to every other point in the structure and then does that for all the points. Uh, and that kind of removes out the spatial effects of the distribution. And then we also show what would be a random distribution for, for, the, for the microstructure. So what we see here is that the, the uncorrelated and the random are actually pretty similar, but the correlated distribution shows a pretty strong peak. What that indicates is that there's a specific ori orientation relationship that develops uh, between adjacent uh, pixels during the phase transformation in this case, where the material is, is uh, deposited and, and solidifies. Um, and then it starts off in a, in, a, in, a, in a cubic beta phase, transforms to uh, an alpha hexagonal phase, and it transforms in a very uh, well uh, described crystallographic relationship. And so as it transforms from one phase to the other, it develops these specific orientation relationships. So this distribution is sort of showing us a fingerprint of that distribution. And we can take these same misorientation relationships and we can fit them to what's termed a misorientation distribution function. So it gives us the uh, the 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 probability or the, or the uh, above randomness that a specific relationship has, has uh, developed. Uh, and so this is uh, important because it can be used to analyze the, the deformation and the orientation relationships that developed during the phase transformation uh, and can give us an idea of how uh, crystal planes are aligned uh, between different uh, packets and different lasts in the structure. Of course, once we have the grain size information, uh, we, can, we can create a grain size distribution. Uh, and so in this case, we're showing grain sizes with both the step sizes. Uh, and so the one on the left where we're using 600 nanometer steps, this we're looking at a larger area. So we're looking um, at more grains. So here we're over 40,000 grains. 
The average grain size is just over three microns. Uh, when we go to the right on the 200 nanometer steps, we're looking at a smaller area, only about 3,500 grains, but because we're using smaller pixels, we can resolve smaller features, so the average grain size drops down to about 2.9 microns. Uh, and we can see from the, the fitting sort of where the averages are and, and where we are in measuring the distribution. Uh, with the 600 nanometer steps, the lower end of the distribution curve isn't really as well defined, but we do see the peak pretty well. With the 200 nanometers, we start to see more clearly the full distribution, uh, but we can certainly get an idea where the average is. Of course, when we're, when we're calculating grain size, in the previous example, what we're doing is we're taking uh, a certain number of pixels uh, to create a grain area, and then from the average area, we convert that to an equivalent diameter, assuming sort of a circular grain. We saw from the grain maps that these grains are not really uh, circular, uh, they're more uh, lath needle shaped. So rather than present data in terms of grain size diameter, we can talk in terms of grain area. So here we get an average grain area uh, that's a little more appropriate. And then we can use the um, we can use the fact that for each of the grains we can fit a uh, an ellipse to the grain shape. Uh, once we fit the ellipse, then we can determine the average aspect ratio of, of the major axis of an ellipse versus the minor axis of the ellipse. Uh, and, and with that information, we can then, from the grain area, figure out sort of what's the average lath spacing. Uh, and that gives us an idea here of about 800 nanometers. So we can, we can better describe the actual shape uh, of the microstructure numerically uh, rather than just an equivalent diameter. Now, um, one of the things that this microstructure reminded me of is, of course, where when these materials are made, there, uh, you know, your powder is is, uh, is is you know liquefied and then solidifies pretty quickly to form this nice lath structure. Um, you know, the lath size and packet size will will be influenced by the cooling rate. Um, but the microstructure re reminded me of of. Uh, different titanium alloys that have been heated up into the beta transition, into the beta temperature, and then cooled. So in this case, it's a water-cooled Ti-6-4, um, and kind of shows the microstructure uh, and, the, and the grain size for this type of material. And what we're able to do is we can sort of correlate the size uh, and distribution of the microstructure with the cooling rates that occur locally in different parts of the additive lens manufactured material. And this is just an example to show uh, how this same alloy, rather than, than water-cooled, uh, if we do an air cooling, so it, it's not quite as quick, uh, we get a quite different uh, microstructure, uh, you know, spatially and visually. Uh, and so, again, we know from the microstructure sort of how the material has cooled and developed uh, as a function of time. Now, one of the things that EBSD is really great for is for showing us what the texture is or what the preferred orientation develops. You can imagine uh, if all the grains are completely randomly oriented, there would be no preferred orientation or no texture. Um, if, if a certain orientation will develop, uh, then we, we term it having a texture. And that's what we see here in these pole figures. So these are showing uh, the distribution of... Uh, of the 112 RO uh, planes in the material. Uh, and this is sort of representative of what we'd expect of a solidification tef uh, texture uh, from a paper by uh, Glavicek uh, in 2003. Um, because of, of how the sample uh, is, is um, was presented to us, you know, we, we've measured this in, a, in what we call our sample reference fr frame. We don't know exactly how that sample corresponds with the, with the deposition uh, direction, so it's hard to correlate this solidification with, say, the beam pass. Um, but if, if we had a little bit more information, I think you could actually uh, understand how it solidifies as a function of the, of the uh, deposition parameters. Uh, on the right there, we also see that the, the alpha uh, uh, the alpha phase is weaker than the beta phase shown on the right. Uh, you know, the, the beta phase is going to have a stronger 
uh, texture because as the beta grains transform to the alpha, there are different possible variants that occur. So we get a little bit of a weakening with the texture, but we can see how the uh, 100 pole there on the right uh, is related to the 112 bar O pole on the left spatially, but it has uh, a few different possible orientations it can transform into. Now, one of the reasons I think EBSD is, is interesting for the, the, the Thai 6.4 alloys for added manufacturing um, is that titanium is, is anisotropic. Um, you will get different properties in different directions. And this just shows the idea that because we're measuring the orientations, we can uh, measure or predict sort of what the elastic response is in different directions under different loads. So this just shows taking this piece and saying, if we were to put the, <coughs> the grains into compression in different directions, so when we put here normal direction, that would be saying, I'm going to push down on the sample relative to the picture. The TD direction in the middle means I'd push from the sides, left and right, push in in compression. And RD on the right, I'd push from top to bottom. So we're going to put the material in three different compressive stress states. And we get an idea of how those grains would respond to that stress based on their orientation. And so we can calculate an elastic uh, modulus, an average elastic modulus. So in this case, it was about 136 gigapascals in the normal direction and the rolling direction, but it changes to about 120 in the transverse direction. So you know, we can measure this with EBSD, but it gives the idea of if we could locally uh, control the microstructure, could you enhance better biocompatibility to given uh, <coughs> requirements in local parts of a, of a microstructure. Now, of course, if we are going to try to uh, engineer local aspects of the microstructure, one of the things we want to be able to measure is, is what's the spatial inhomogeneity uh, of a microstructure. So this just shows an example here. Uh, you know, the orientation map on the left kind of visually shows the spatial distribution, but we can quantify that with some tools we call like a texture gradient uh, analysis where we see a uniformity factor and a banding factor to try to get an idea of you know, how similar or how different uh, the microstructure is in general uh, across the, the measurement area. Then in, in addition to looking at the, uh, the elastic response, we can also do what we call Taylor factor analysis, where uh, for uh, a given material, we know uh, what the slip systems would be uh, and we know uh, what the crystal orientation is, and then if we apply uh, an applied stress state, we'll get an idea of which grains uh, should be in a position to deform easily via, via slip and which grains will be in a position to resist slip. Uh, and it kind of gives us an idea of maybe areas where Taylor factor differences would be different uh, that can lead to you know, cracking void formation. Uh, so these are just an examples here. I, I put in just a basal slip uh, as a slip system. I've taken the same microstructure here. I put it in a, in a compression in the RD, so again, top to bottom, and then in the ND, kind of pushing down uh, to get an idea of which grains uh, are, are easily deformed and which day grains are heavily deformed and, and how the contrast is between those. And so with this, you can put in whatever slip systems you want and put in a, a, a stress state matrix um, to get an idea of, of localized response. The other thing that EBSD is, is pretty commonly used for is for measuring uh, plastic deformation of material. So as a material is, is, is uh, stressed beyond its uh, elastic yield or its, its yield limit, uh, we start to get some permanent deformation. And that deformation uh, can cause change in orientations that we can measure with EBSD. Uh, and so for this particular sample, uh, it's been fatigue tested. I'm not sure of the exact conditions. Uh, and so we, we ran the EBSD uh, in a condition where we're, we're really looking for good uh, low angle misorientation characterization. Uh, and so we measure this with what we call a grain orientation spread or, or a Gauss value. And what we see is that there are some of these last that have some, uh, some deformation in there. So on the, on the maps, uh, the bluer grains are, are less deformed. Uh, the yellow to red grains are more deformed. And we see that there are, there's a, at least a distribution of, um, of deformation present in the microstructure. 
Now, with this, where we don't have a lot to compare it to, it, it, it's hard to say. You know, we, had to, we don't have one that was uh, fatigued less versus more, which would often give us an idea of, of what kind of uh, deformation may develop. But it gives us an idea of, of what the inherent structure is uh, at the time of analysis. We can look at these same measurements, uh, but rather than on a grain basis, which we saw with the Gauss, we can look at it on a point-to-point -point measurement. And we do this with what's called a CAM or kernel average misorientation measurement, where we're just measuring the misorientation with every point with all of its six neighbors. And I say six neighbors because we've measured uh, our data on a hexagonal grid to give us six equidistant neighbors. And so with this measurement, because we're, we're not measuring uh, a grain-based thing but point-to-point, uh, here, our measurements will depend on the step size and the scale of the local deformation. But what we see here, we're using that same color code, is that it's much bluer and, and much more uh, homogeneous. So, you know, the, the deformation we're seeing is, is occurring on a larger scale uh, than the step size here. And so what that means is our, our precision for measuring the deformation uh, with this step size, you know, we're, we're, we're not measuring things on the 600 or 200 nanometer limit. But as we look at larger grains, then we're starting to see more of the deformation present uh, within those lath grains. So what we can do to sort of bridge the gap is if we don't want to do a whole grain calculation, but our kernel's too small, we can do what we call local orientation spread. So uh, it's similar to the grain orientation spread, but instead of doing a grain base, we're just going to do a local kernel. Uh, and so we can define the size of that kernel size. We can go up to, to 10 nearest neighbors. Uh, it's a little more computationally intensive, um, but it gives us an idea of what the, what the local uh, plastic orientation spread is in the material. And so here uh, we see it for both on the, on the left and the right, a little more homogeneous than what we saw on the, on the kernel maps. Now, one of the questions that, that would be asked is that, you know, can some of these metrics like grain orientation spread and local orientation spread be correlated uh, with the orientations? That is to say, are there certain orientations that are going to deform more easily than others? And we can look at this as what's called a scalar texture. So we, we, uh, we want to look at the, the texture effects on uh, different parameters. So here we're showing the scalar textures on the Gauss. Uh, and the local orientation spread values. Uh, we see a few hot spots in the distribution that show some type of an orientation effect uh, that some grains are deforming more than others. And then we can also look at uh, deformation with what we call a, a G-ROD, or grain reference orientation deviation map. Uh, we can look at this in both uh, with an angle map and an axis map. So with the G-ROD, what we're doing is we, we first calculate uh, uh, an average orientation per grain, uh, and then we look at the misorientation of each point uh, relative to that average orientation. We can look at the misorientation in terms of angle on the left or the misorientation axis on the right. Um, and so what you see here is we can see the deformation within the, some of the last here. Uh, we can also see in the, in the axis map uh, when there seems to be some sort of structured uh, misorientations, we see solid colors uh, that gives an idea of, well, I've just kind of turned it a segmentally deformed grain. We see grain going along the length uh, of the lath there uh, with some coherency. And finally, I mentioned we also uh, can use simultaneous EDS elemental mapping. And so at each point, we can collect the, the EDS spectra. Uh, we, can, we can turn that into certain elemental maps. So here I've shown it in Thai aluminum and vanadium maps here. Uh, it's hard to see in a titanium map, but uh, on the aluminum vanadium maps, you can start to see some of the last structure. So we see some chemical segregation. Um, we see that, you know, I classify these in two. I've just called them components. One component's higher in titanium aluminum. One's higher in the vanadium. Um, but what you see here is that if we, if we segment this, the, the fraction difference is higher than the measured phase fractions. Remember, we only saw 2% uh, um, beta phase. So, you know, the question is, is the EDS partitioning some sort of an orientation effect? Again, we go to a scalar measurement. Um, we, we see a little bit of an orientation effect that, that certain orientations seem to have more or less uh, aluminum and vanadium. Uh, 
Um, you know, is this a phase transformation or variant selection type of an effect? I'm not really sure. But more probable is this is probably going to be uh, kind of a, a phase and interaction volume uh, type of an effect. So if we look at the, the EBSD phase map for a, a zoomed in region on the left, we see the, uh, the alpha phase in blue, the beta phase in yellow. Um, we see pretty good uh, correlation of, of uh, the chemical distributions here. Uh, but of course, on this step size, we're using 200 nanometer step sizes. The EDS interaction volume is larger than our step size. We're running here at, at 20 kV, so our, our, we're looking at more micron size interaction volume, where our EBSD signal source volume is going to be much smaller than the step size. So we have you know, sort of two orders of magnitude spatially in terms of where signal's coming from. And I think that's why our EDS volumes are, are much broader than the phase volumes we measure with the EDS, but we see a lot of the same spatial type distribution. And so, you know, if this is something you want to try to resolve with, with uh, chemistry, you could try going to a lower voltage, you can try going to a thin film or transmission approach to improve the EDS spatial resolution. Um, I don't really think it's necessary because in this case we can just use EBSD to resolve the phases directly. Uh, but I think it explains why we see a little bit of a difference. And we can break this out just to kind of show how the, uh, the distributions uh, change as a function of, of crystal phase. So we see that the two phases there on these multi-charts show, uh, you know, different uh, distributions of the aluminum, titanium, and vanadium um, for each of the detectors. And so with our detectors, we have nice high throughput uh, detectors that improve the EDS counting statistics at each point that allow us to do this sort of uh, distribution and counting analysis. So in summary, what I wanted to try to show is, is mainly that EBSD can be used to characterize the microstructure of these additively manufactured metallic materials. Um, EDS data can also be acquired uh, simultaneously and used to support and supplement this crystallographic analysis. Uh, and then, of course, the Prius imaging I showed can provide a very fast microstructural contrast imaging relative to EBSD mapping, which is going to take you know, uh, more minutes and hours for the type of images we're showing here. But hopefully what I wanted to try to communicate is that there's a large range of analytical possibilities uh, for using EBSD. Uh, that gives a, an encouraging outlook at using this microstructural characterization to provide information to engineer uh, to improve additive manufacturing uh, material performance. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and invite you to submit any questions via the Q&A widget below.